trap. Hello and welcome to Be Real, the Maryland Real Estate Podcast. I'm Brad Cox with the Vesta Group of Long and Foster, and I'm joined by the positively prodigious. <laughs> prodigious. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to Google these once again during our break. <laughs> Michael Becker of Sierra Pacific Mortgage. Michael, <laughs> yes, great sir. to see you today, dude. How you doing? I'm doing great, but I'm probably more awake than you are. Yeah, I'm a little tired. Uh, I went to an incredible concert last night, and they kind of they can wear on you a little bit. A little. I think my voice will be a little deeper from screaming <laughs> and having a couple adult beverages prior to the concert. I, I can't wait to go. Yeah. In September, Bruce to see Bruce. Yeah, that was that. So I'm glad you enjoyed the concert last it, night. It uh, was so much fun. Played a lot of favorites. We had very good seats. I have some good uh, clips I'll share on Facebook. But um, the most entertaining part for me was going with two kids and a wife and sharing it with them and watching them have the time of their lives absolutely. and getting that on film. Absolutely. Like there's times when I'll pan from taking that you know uh, video of the band over to them and seeing them sing along and dancing was great that's fantastic you know i never went to a concert with my parents it's kind of cool that we do that now. i don't think i ever did either you know no. but you yeah. would go with a, to take your daughter I would to a take, concert sure. and your son Absolutely. to a concert in a second yeah right? although when we go in the, in the fall we're not taking our kids it's now, just well, the two of us and, well ryan will be away at school well, and anna's gonna be in chicago so so not to you know that was probably part of your financial literacy because <laughs> that's a little foreshadowing, folks. Yeah. Uh, because it can, you might need to take a mortgage out sometimes to take four people. Oh my gosh! To, to it's got to these so days. much money, so much money. First concert for me, nineteen seventy eight, Cheap Trick at Painter's oh, Mill. Wow. Yeah. Eight dollars and fifty cent was it? Can you? Oh <laughs> that's man, that's what it was. Oh yeah. Well, and you now, know, I now it's two hundred to a thousand dollars. You know, if you want really good right, seats, you're going right. to spend a fortune. So, not that he's as much as some of these musical acts, but you remember Steve Martin when he was first doing stand up yeah. comedy? Well, yeah, he had yeah. this one shtick, and he was saying something about. What do you want for four dollars? Every time <laughs> yeah, yeah. he says that, I think back and I'm like, "Yeah, yeah those were the days. Those were the that days. was really nice." When right. it, it was nice. Yeah. Well. Any. Anyway, so, Michael. Yes, sir. It's episode thirteen. Baker's dozen. Yeah. Yeah. Lucky thirteen. I was gonna say that. Uh, well, I'm not right. a uh, Triskaidekaphobia. Phobic. Right. Is right. that the right number? Is I that the right think term? That's right. Yeah. 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 Just Look at you it. pulling out the vocab. I'm trying to be sesquipedalian this <laughs> week as well. All right, then. We're talking about home selling mistakes, the top 10 seller slip-ups. Slip-ups, right. Mistakes yeah. that they can make. Yeah, Things absolutely. to be prevent, that are preventable mistakes. Right, and like we talked about last week when we did the home buying mm -hmm. mistakes, th these are things that we see our clients do not our clients actually because they know what they're doing because they get advice from us but Correct. but we see these things happen time and time again and uh, i actually i pointed out to you earlier today a listing that that we both knew about mm -hmm. and i hadn't looked at it yet but it's it's sad to me how bad the listing looks and that that was un unfortunately expected right yeah, just yeah. bad photos and things laying all over the house. It's it's one of those typical bad MLS photo examples. Not as bad as the one I shared with you. Not that quite. One time, not quite. But I've, I've seen people who it's just a complete mess of a house, and they still take interior photos that way. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's staging. There's virtual staging. There's cleaning the place up. These are all nice ways to make your pictures look nice. And then there's total lack of effort of even. Sh I mean, you don't have to clean the house, but at least tidy Straighten it up, up a little bit. Yeah, right? something. Right. Somebody well, somewhere. Help. All right. Well, so Michael, we're gonna roll right in to the rundown. To the rundown. Okay. So let's hear about the mortgage world. Well, for the first time in four weeks, we had mortgage applications decrease, which surprised yeah. me because they've been going pretty strong. Um, these are seasonally adjusted numbers, but even the seasonally the not seasonally adjusted numbers saw a decrease. So I'll stick with the seasonally adjusted numbers. Overall, the composite index dropped four point one percent. This is the week ending March thirty first. Yeah. So it was the last week. In March, March was a pretty busy week when it came to for applications. 
um, and for closings per year for, for your data. Yeah, yeah. Purchases were down four percent, and refinances were down five percent. So on average, refinances only make it about twenty eight, twenty nine percent of the market these days. So right, th- them going down a little bit has doesn't move the needle as much as the purchase. Interest rates, they had interest rates declining, which they did since this is March 31st, to 6.4%. Mm-hmm. I thought something something I thought was interesting in this report was even though mortgage rates, conventional mortgage rates, those below $726,100, mm-hmm. or I'm sorry, conventional rates with conforming limits of $726,100, mm-hmm. those rates declined. Jumbo rates increased by nine basis points. I think that may go to the bank crisis. A lot of the banks yeah, yeah. that have, you know, there's concern about bank stability out there. Some have closed. I'm not saying there's a crisis. Maybe I shouldn't use the term crisis. But when when things like this happen and you're concerned about your capital, specifically if some of the assets you have are these mortgage-backed securities and treasuries that are sitting on unrealized losses, yeah, you might tighten up your lending a little bit. A few weeks ago, it seemed like the economy is doing so well before the bank closures, and we were seeing rates rise, and then they happened. We saw a little rally. Right. And then this week, you know, to continue on, because I'm going to get to my vote, I voted for them to say flat. It was mostly because right. the big rally in at the beginning of the week, we saw some of the signs of a slowing economy that might help the Fed to pause or, and at some point, maybe pivot and come back, start dropping rates back yeah. a little bit. Started the week off with a ISM number that's Institute of Supply Management. They have a manufacturing sector for the seventh month in a row. It was in contraction and contraction territory, not expanding. Right. And it was the lowest reading since May of 2020. Well, May of 2020 was the heart of COVID, which, you know, two months after the initial shutdown. Right. So that's a pretty low reading. Then it was followed up by a JOLTS report. This report is something that's been concerning the Federal Reserve. JOLTS stands for Job Openings and Labor Turnover Survey. Mm-hmm. And they had been it had been between 11, for the longest time, it was 11 million open jobs. One month, it dropped to 10,400,000 open jobs, and it bumped back up to 10.8 million. Well, this time, it dropped to 9.9. It was a huge That's drop, a one, of the drop. Big, yeah. one of the biggest ever. The next the next report was the ISM services sector, not manufacturing, because service is a bigger part of our economy than manufacturing. It's still an expansion, but it also slowed drastically right so right. all those things led to declining rates then the market said oh on thursday well, hold on here we got a big report coming out friday that's <laughs> the jobs report maybe we're getting ahead of ourselves we gave up a little bit of gains and then the jobs report came out and it was in line with expectations uh what we i the headline number was right around 236 very in right. line with the expectation i think right. what concerns the market is the labor participation rate jumped a lot more people started entering the market and even though a lot of people entered the market looking for jobs, the unemployment mm-hmm. rate still dropped. It was went from 3.6 to 3.5. That means some of these people entering the market are finding jobs, and that may concern the bond market to the Fed. Its job is not done. They really want to see a tightening of labor conditions. Um, and most of the surveys at the beginning of the week or most of the economic news pointed to that, but the jobs report on Friday, except for the fact that hourly Average hourly wages came in a little softer than expected, and year over year it declined to 4.3 percent. If that gets down a little bit more, you know, two to three percent, the Fed would be okay with those kind of year over year hourly wages. So, yeah. Uh, next week is CPI. That's the ne- next big next report. Big one. That'll be a big one. Uh, I think it's going to probably come in. It's going to con- show continued declining inflation. The question is how much. Right. If right. It, if it, if inflation declines more than expected, we'll see rallies in mortgage rates. If not, if it's a little worse than expected, you might see them bump back up again. Again, if you have a loan officer you're working with, they need to be paying attention to those things. And if the bond market had rallied the end of that report, I would lock. Yeah, yeah. If it had sold off into that report, I'd have a conversation and say, hey, this is a big report to market. Go either way. What do you want to do? It's such a, it's such a tough it's hard. We, for when to, we had a to client lock. this week that we a mutual yeah. client that I locked in, and I locked in because we had four straight days of rally. Well, right. if I waited another day, day and a half, he could have gotten him slightly better. But by the end of the week, he's in a much better place than where rates ended at the end of the week. So I would say I did a good job. It, nobody yeah, can absolutely nobody can time the perfect top or bottom. Right. You know. Right. Over a short period of time. Right. Absolutely. Right. Great. What about some local numbers? All right. So rolling into the last seven days in the Baltimore metro area, last week we were at 
351 active properties. This week, we only have 298. It's a drop of 15%. That's not good. It's not what we want to see. I do we see a see lot of more coming. More. How about, I mean. It's My the, stuff includes coming soon. Does it really? Okay. Yeah. I didn't yeah. know that. <clears throat> yeah. I, but I seem, the, seem to think there's been an increase in that stuff. That has, it's helping, but we still don't have anywhere near enough. All right. So that down 15%. Pending sales went up. We were at 736 last week, 811 this week. So increase of 10%. So it's. Kind of the inverse of what you want to see this time of year. More selling than than going under than coming on the market. Settled sales, five forty five last week, four fifty three, so down sixteen point eight eight percent. Makes sense. Less, yeah, homes less for available, sale. right? Uh, properties off the market. Remember, we talked a little bit about this last week because it was a little weird. We were yeah. seeing more than we anticipated. Well, we it kind of stabilized so we were at 408 last week Let's 226 turn. this week so it's down 44.61 percent well, yeah and and this is more in line with what we would expect to see all right so average days on the that's market that's what i want to see i bet that dropped well given what happened you'd, you'd think but yeah. average days on the market actually went up 2.28 percent is that skewed by a few homes just a few. you never know yeah 30.7 last week to 31.4 it's, I haven't had a client buy a same. home in a year that a house has been on the market 30 something. <laughs> right, days, right. Right. If yeah. you don't get an offer in the first week, it's surprising. It surprises yeah. me too. Well, I looked at some of the ones. It's funny. When I was looking at the data, the well, ones could, that have been on the market, mm-hmm. currently active listings that have been on the market for greater than 30 days, yeah. stories the same throughout each one of them. No price reductions. Seller has probably unrealistic expectations. They're holding on to those numbers. They've made no change in 30 days, even in a market like this. Does the value of the home have anything to play with it? Meaning if you have a higher price point, there's less of a buyer pool. So, you know, like it can. Yeah. You know, we have a but, very specific property. Like you don't have a cookie cutter house. Let's yeah. say you have a million dollar property, but sure. it's, I don't know, modern architecture, let's say, as opposed to colonial. Sure. Right. Sure. That not everybody's going to be into. It's a smaller buyer pool. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, so you, you'd expect to see that somewhat in those situations. But this was across the board, and that's what you see. It's okay. it's nobody's budging from their prices when they're sitting too low. Well, and they're the, probably this, being told not to do that and that it's still a seller's market. It is still a seller's know. market, but that it's such an extreme seller's market that if you haven't gotten an offer uh. within the first two weeks— there's something well, buyers probably have become wrong with your so number. sophisticated these days into the how fast they have to act if a house comes on market that yeah. if they come across a house that maybe has been on the market for 30, 45 days, they might Im- I'm, I don't want to put any words in their mouth, but they might immediately think, what's wrong with this? Well, right, right. You know? Yeah. All right. Total volume, because we had everything else go down. This one went down correspondingly as well. So 221 last week, 221 million down to 168 million. So 23.86% down. Concessions also down in the number of concessions, about 30%. The percentage of concessions, though, which you would think maybe might stay flat, actually decreased. So went from 32.84% of the Sold sold homes that had concessions down to 27.59, so almost 16% drop there. Okay, how about The that? average concession, though, went up. Hmm. So it went up from 7,037 to 7,682. It's almost it's 9.17% up. All right, your average list to sold price, how, how accurate are agents being with the uh, list and the sales price? Last week, we're at 103.08 with... Auctions, auctions included 102.06 this week, so down a percent. The excluding auctions mm-hmm. that's the one I care about, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 99.42 last week, 99.93. This 100%. Week. It's, all, it's 100%. Yeah, 100%. How about that up sense. a half point? Makes sense. And, and the that's media, maybe why people are stubborn about dropping their well, price. and it can be, but, the, but they may but, have been given bad information, which we'll get into, yeah, yeah. All right, so that median sold price, we watch that. 
Last week, 347.5. This week, 372. Just an indication of the properties that sold, not necessarily a trend. You know, you know we, we talked about that before, how seven days doesn't make a trend. That's right. more indicative of the houses that were sold, but but up 7%. So, right. And I looked I looked at some of the data to, you know, what the numbers that go into these things. So just to give you an idea, we had a lot more expired listings last week than we did this week. Uh-huh. This week, we only had 56. Um, 40 canceled, 54 that were withdrawn, and then 76 that are temp off. Those are the numbers that go into the off-market number that I aggregate. Takeaway for the sellers Mm -hmm. is listen to what we have to say in this podcast today. Okay, fair enough. Make sure that you're doing the things that we suggest because homes that are selling are the homes that that are priced right, and that are prepared prepared well. When there's an issue, they are still sitting. All right, so Michael. Yes, sir. When we come back, we'll be we're talking about those home selling mistakes, top ten seller slip ups. Be yep. right back. Cool. Try. And we're back to Be Real, the Maryland Real Estate Podcast. I'm Brad Cox with the Vesta Group of Long and Foster, and I'm joined by, by the always erudite. <laughs> that was a, not only was that a nice word, it was alliteration. I try. I try. I'm impressed. Michael Becker. That's my name. And I work at Sierra Pacific Mortgage. And I'm I thought you were going to say, that's my name. Don't wear it out. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's yeah. a good one. I could have said, I will, I'll remember that for the next time. Yeah, uh, yeah. Anyway, Brad, we're going to talk about home selling mistakes yeah, and yeah. top 10 seller slip ups. And you got a great list here. Yeah, well. And I'm going to do my best to add to your list. That's great. All right, well, let's roll right in. Number one mistake mm-hmm. overpricing the home. And and that's, that's so common that. Buyer that sellers decide uh, we want to list it for because they've seen all the activity because they've heard the news and they they listen to what their neighbors down the road did and then they think well there's no reason why our house is so much better than theirs let's list for higher and so they put this number out there now here's the thing sometimes you can stretch. You can list aggressively get a, well, to would, try to get a higher number. The marketing does help, but let's just... But you want to be realistic, too. And let's let's just put this out there. Zillow rolled out however many years ago, 10, 15 years ago, right? That data is democratized now. It's available to everyone, right. and that has made such a huge difference in the buyer pool, the education uh, level you're of so, buyers. Even in my... From my standpoint, so when I do a purchase, you know, and I get a contract or I put numbers together for somebody, I wonder if it'll appraise and I let, you know, if it seems like they're, you know, because it could be a competitive situation where they're going over the list and I'll look and yeah. have to let the buyer know what the consequences of going over that is. The reason I bring this up in the old days, you know how I used to look up comps? You're right, because you could, you, anybody can go on to Zillow and switch it from for sale to sold, sold. and right. you can change it into a time frame of the last three months, six months, 12 months, yeah. and you can see what's sold on it. You can look on it. Now, now some what of you the, might not notice are things like seller credits and other things And there's like data that, that but, might be yeah. wrong because, the, yeah. the, you know, they might have the square footage for a specific home include below grade, which it shouldn't. Right, right. In the old days, I used to use Maryland land records. If I somebody was buying a house, I'd search by area and map, mm-hmm. and I'd look for similar styled homes, ranchers and split levels kind of together. If you're a colonial, I want to look for colonials, those, that type of thing. Right. Similar number of bedrooms, similar square footage, similar age. But Zillow's even better because now you have, many times, especially after the sold, some of the times the pictures aren't taken down. You can actually true, look, true. take a look and see what's inside the house right. without having access to the multiple list system. So right. that point, as far as being democratized, the data for anybody out there. Yeah. And it, it's the it's Zillows my, of the world. I'm right. not just No, I'm you have Realtor, selling, Redfin. Yeah. There's all I mean, these ways. There's so many different portals out there. Long and Foster has a portal. There's so many right. that are available. That data is accessible to everyone. 
And so the buyer pool is much more educated than they ever were. And as a result, when they see a property that is listed higher than what they believe it should be for that neighborhood, because they've been looking in that neighborhood, they know and they ignore it. So they're does, like, oh, that's overpriced. I'm not so going to go see it. You're right. I would agree 100%. So the problem of overpricing a home, does it come, I mean, it's probably joint. Does it come from the agent standpoint? Because, you know, when you're trying to get a listing, it, it can be a... Comp- there's well, a phrase called buying the listing. Yeah, there's yeah, people that's who, when you just say, yep, we'll list it at whatever price you want, right? And that's, you do a disservice to a seller when you do that because honestly, I can point to tons of examples where you start out at a higher number and the property sits and you go price reduction, price reduction, price reduction, and you wind up getting lower price than you would have if originally. You said it reasonably, maybe if you had multiple it. offers and competitive offers. Right. I, I, I agree a hundred percent with yep. that. Yep. You know, I remember I had a client, a previous client of mine who I helped uh, refinance the home and they were going to sell it and they called me up and they said, Look, we're having a hard time selling it before I reconnected with you. Yeah. I'm looking at it, I'm like, I, you know, I started looking up data and I'm like, I think this house is listed too high, but maybe you should have a realtor look at it for you. And I asked them where they got their agent. <laughs> it was from a billboard. Oh, yeah. What a great source. <laughs> no, I mean, it is advertising. It's worth a call, but maybe you should have spoke to one other person. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. It's a good and, point. All right. So that's number one, pricing too high. It, mm-hmm. it's, it's a risk. It doesn't mean you can't try to price aggressively, but you got to price smart. Got to price smart. You got to know what's going on in the market to be able to do that. And so talk to a professional, get the right numbers, because even though the data is accessible, democratized, they don't have all the details that the listing agents will have for a property. Well, especially if you have some salient features that stand out that may not go into pictures, but will be present or will show themselves if people view the home sh- sure you know, and there are very, showings and that's done by you know and there are a number of times when we go into properties and you you can't tell necessarily the difference between one property or another in photos but you go into a property and the quality of the craftsmanship in yeah. one home versus another can make a big difference and so we might have that perspective where you're not going to pick that up on zillow right. all right so that's and number one number one number two Failing to prepare the home for sale. This is a, this is based on a show we did talking about preparing your home for sale. Mm-hmm. I bet a lot of people in this market think it's such a seller's market. Well, I don't have to do anything to sell my house. Nope. Yeah. Sure. And it depends. Why would you? Why right. would you? Right. Well, everything I mean, everything that you put on the market sells right away. Sells right away. Yeah. Except for the ones that aren't prepared. That are, and you're not always talking about major fix fixing things up now you can certainly consider that if you want to get top dollar but you're just talking about cleaning decluttering uh necessary necessary minor repairs right right, right. like if you're if you walk through a house you're going to list would you and there was um uh outlet covers missing would you absolutely you want to put those on and they cost what two bucks a piece See, little things like that yeah maybe touch up paint here and there you know right. uh cleaning that making the house clean and keeping it clean decluttering it you decluttering is a big if you're moving it's probably a smart move anyway because you you should start the moving process by getting rid of what you're not taking to the remember next the house. chuck it or truck it yes, that we sir. talked about yes, in the sir. in the other episode but yeah absolutely so don't neglect those tasks And listen to an agent. Bring an agent in. We can give you great advice on what you should do to get your home ready. The idea isn't to make your life more difficult. It's to maximize the amount that you get and how quickly that house can sell as well. Have you ever had a hoarder's house to sell? Yeah, sure. And then you must then you must have some a cleaning service. You have, can do yeah, that. we have yeah. a couple of different groups that can come in. Go in absolutely because that's a, that's something that I I bet a lot of agents might run from. But you know a little bit of you know everybody deserves care. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. So we have a great preparing your home for sale guide. So if you, you want a copy of that, just send us an email. Hello at berealpod.com. And just request that, and we'll be happy to shoot that out to you. All right. Number three. Yes. Refusing to negotiate or taking lower offers personally. There's still, so I would say questions that I get a lot from borrowers 
and uh, young people, they've heard that the real estate market may soften maybe softening yeah. and they're starting to think that maybe they can lowball these offers which was a, an effect that when it was a buyer's market you could do that in the past sure I'm not so sure it's smart and it's because there's tons of people out there who are likening the slowing of the real estate market to the financial crisis and the housing bubble and we've said and it's many a time, completely different situation it's a totally different situation yeah. we're not going to have massive foreclosures and massive inventory yeah. come into market now inventory might if the, if the Fed raises rates and gets the economic slowdown and it pushes into recession and we see some job losses, that does, that may up, we might see a few home sales sure. at that point. Sure. Uh, you can always sell a home with, you don't need a job to sell a home. Yeah. You know? True. And if you're True. sitting on a ton of equity, yeah. you might be able to sell and go buy a smaller home. Yeah. But and the point is, when they, if an Don't take it personal. In, don't take it personal. Don't have that knee jerk reaction of getting insulted and, and, and don't just reject the offer outright. Right, we we have clients who we talk that. to regularly, and we tell them don't don't just don't just reject it. Always counter. Just keep the conversation going yep, because you, you never, never know. know. That could have just been an aggressive play in the very beginning, and that buyer and that buyer's agent is ready to cave and give you what you want. They just thought, well, can't hurt to give it a shot. Right. So always counter. All right. Moving on to point number four. Not disclosing known issues or trying to hide some problems. It'll come back to haunt you. It'll come back to haunt you in a big way. Maryland's a disclosure state, so okay. it's not a caveat mTOR state. So if you know of any issues that are latent defects, any kind of material fact, you are obligated by Maryland law to disclose that to the buyer. So I highly advise home sellers to disclose any of that. If you had water damage in the ha in the property if you've got ongoing water penetration any structural issues any of that kind of stuff if you've got some roofing damage you know if you know that your hvac only works intermittently right <laughs> whatever it is you've got to disclose that to the buyers and yeah. Yeah, so don't don't ignore that because that absolutely can bite you. It's fraud if you're not. It doing. is. Absolutely. Yeah. And you can get sued. You can. Yeah. Not that I'm an attorney. And you should always talk to an attorney if you have any questions about but any of these you things. You should but disclose any latent. You details. have an obligation. All right. Number five. I, <laughs> Who would want to be pre be in president showing? Yes. And I you you'd think nobody would want to be around some, what do they want why do they want to be president is it they want to sometimes see what people say sometimes it, it's or, what are they yeah what what's people's reaction i can be here nobody knows this house as well as i do nobody can sell it like i can oh i got you and so they stick around or, or or i'm working from home i'm super busy i can't take the time to leave well okay that's that's an awkward that's situation maybe a little somebody's... bit more valid but the point is it's you're right it's an awkward situation and the buyers when they come in you don't want them to feel awkward you want them to be drawn to the house immediately right you sitting there is not going to help that gonna help. that's not going to help so yes try not to be there it's a turn off to potential buyers they're not going to feel comfortable talking to the realtor showing them the property people are going to be shown the house by realtors they're not going to be traipsing through the house un unguided and and if they are that's a problem with that particular realtor because there's we should follow professionalism standards but that that's never a good idea to be there all right would agree number six not marketing the home effectively. Oh, look at that. And I mentioned talking about I talked about marketing in number you, number one over the price in the home you absolutely but, did. Yeah, but it goes in, it's a lot of things. Uh, marketing is not just one piece. There's a lot of things that go into it. We have a 27-step marketing plan. <laughs> how, many we use. how many was it? And he went to 27 steps. Well, yeah. yeah. And, well, 27 steps. 27-step plan, yeah. And it's it's that very involved. Very involved. Yeah, but well, that's good. our commitment is to represent the seller the best possible way we can. It makes all the, the more people that know about your house that your house is listed, that know about its wonderful features, yep. that know how great it would be to live there, yep. the better 
it will be. And that goes back and it's to... Still, and it's, I, I'm sorry to cut you off. I apologize. Right. I was going to say, you just had a th- thought, that, and it can go back to the idea that it's such a seller's market, you really don't have to market. You know, all we need is a few people interested in it, and there's so many people wanting to buy homes and so few homes that we don't have to do any marketing. Mm. Well, do you want to leave what? that money on the table? That's probably what you're going to do if you don't yeah. market it. Yeah, absolutely. And it goes back to preparing your house for sale. Talk, we talked about the decluttering, the depersonalization, maybe sprucing up, but that's what step one in marketing is putting a good product out there. Step two is great photos and video, online tours, things like that. Putting the, the marketing information out there to the general public and how we accomplish that through syndication and ads that we run. So there's a number of pieces, open houses, other things, signage, all those things go into marketing and it's a, it's a multifaceted approach. So if you fail to market it, yeah, you, you may sell your house, but you're going to be leaving money on the table, which actually goes to a point that we're going to address a little bit later. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Point number seven. Ignoring feedback from potential buyers. So we regularly ask listing uh, buyers agents when they're showing the property, "What's yeah, can let you them provide know. any feedback?" And they don't always provide it. We can't force them to provide any feedback, but uh, good agents most often they'll give you some feedback. If you're getting consistent feedback about a particular issue in your house, it's a great idea to try to address that issue. Yeah. Right. If somebody comes in and says, I don't like the hey, p- you the really paint. should take down all of these uh, stuffed animal heads on your wall. Somebody or, who's a hunter. Right? right. Yeah. Or it could be a number of different things, right? Or this, you know, the kitchen was dirty and you hear that every time. Well, you know, we're all living in our homes every day. You made breakfast for your kids and you rushed out to get out to, you know, to work and couldn't get everything cleaned up to the level that you thought maybe you should. Right. Yeah, well, you can get that feedback. If that's all it takes, yeah. Yeah. Or it could be as simple as I hate, everybody hates the color of the powder room on the first floor. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it could be such a simple change. Sometimes, Sometimes this feedback, it can be such simple things. And it can make a big difference. Or it may even give you the opportunity to say to the sellers, I told you so. And the only <laughs> thing I mean by that is you might have pointed, you might have said, hey, this might be an issue when coming up, but we'll let, you know, it's okay. Let's listen to it and see what happens. And then you start getting the same feedback. Well, you would never say that, but right. then you, not right. in so many words, you would say it. <laughs> well, uh, you, I'm sure you it's go come back up like you, that. And it happens all the time. But you go back and you say, so we're getting some pretty consistent feedback. Here's all the data. Take a look. Here are think? some of the things that I probably so. bear some <laughs> attention. That's yeah. Funny. yeah. All right. Moving to number eight, not being flexible with showing times. So you got to be, you yeah. got to be flexible. You got to let people have access to the home. Right. And I get that you probably want to be there as much as you can because it's a dis- it's it's a disturbance. Right? Do you block yeah. off times? I mean, what a what's the what's the most often requested time and i don't need to be specific but around well, evenings weekend? and weekends okay. are probably the most common but any time that somebody wants to come see your house is a good thing right. and if you can make that house more accessible to them then i'd advise you to do that that also goes with not requiring too long of an advance notice there are some buyers who you know may be driving through the neighborhood see the sign Maybe you don't let them come in instantly, but if they request a showing for later that day, it'd be helpful if they could come in an hour or two down the road. Right. There are some sellers who say, well, we want 24 hours notice. Well, you can do that, and there may be very good reasons. If you have large pets in the home, things like that, you need to make plans. Yeah. You're not working in the home. You need to be able to accommodate those things. Yeah, you might need to have some advance notice should there, be flexible but, but you also have to set some stand I, I think it, you can't uh drop everything and be out in 15 or 20 minutes sometimes so you know I would yeah understand. so you can you can always got to be some you can always but. indicate hey we want this much advance notice what i usually advise my sellers to do is mm-hmm. make it one or two hours if you can that way you have if you get a showing request you have a reasonable amount of time, time to, to ready, shut to down, yeah. yeah, get out of the house, make sure. Yeah, and, and in markets like we have now, right. a lot of times what we'll sell, we'll tell sellers to do is we're going to get probably, if it's a good house and 
it's, nicely updated, and well, there's going to be high high demand for it. We'll suggest to them take a weekend off. Go you somewhere. might want to you might want to take a little weekend trip. Right, not a bad idea. And then we can get get a, many. You can get a ton of showings in over the weekend, and have all your offers in by Sunday night or Monday afternoon. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's much less of a disturbance to a seller than right. oh, in and out, in and out, in and out over the couple of days. All right, so. Moving on to number nine, not expecting home selling costs. And, uh, you know, there are times when uh, sellers, if you've never, if you've owned a home, but you've never sold a home, you may not realize some of the costs that go into that. It's one of the things I, when people are thinking about selling and buying a new home, they ever calculate, I, I sometimes have to break bad news to them or at least inform us, hey, you're not going to walk with 98, 99% of the sales price, it's probably closer to 92, 93% right, right. of the sales price after you pay buying, listing, and selling agents. That's who selling agents you represent the buyers. I always find that <laughs> funny, but wow. listing and selling agents commissions, you pay your share of recordation transfer taxes, which yep. in the bottom area can be 1% to 2%. Sure. Your share of it. Right. Uh, might have to fix a few things up. You yep. Know, yep. Or, give a, or, or give a seller concession. Right. Yeah. And then the just the general moving expenses that, right. that you incur. Yeah. So there are costs involved with selling the home. Michael's, that's a good barometer that you had there. So it's a, it's a reasonable amount to consider. There are costs. Make sure you factor them in when you're looking at what you're going to net. Now, any good agent will be able to prepare for you a decent they seller's net expenses, a, a net proceeds document. Right. And it's an estimate. It's not to the penny. But uh, what I typically do is I prepare them for my sellers and I give them ranges. If we get an offer here, here's how much you'll net. If we get an offer here, here's how much you'll net. Here's If we get an offer here, here's how much you'll net. And that way they have an idea. Okay, great. Um, we know what we can work with now. And well, it's important, and especially when you're going to buy another home absolutely to know what you have to roll into the next one mm -hmm. yeah all right so let's move on to the next one maybe it's a little self-serving i get no. that but going it alone going it alone the for sale by owner right? fisbo as we say yes yeah, the fisbo and so i i just have a couple of, here's the thing you it it is possible to sell a property without the use of a realtor mm -hmm. of a realtor you, you can do it, right? I want to put a, a couple of questions out there. if Because if you have it in your head that you want to save on any of that realtor compensation, that's one of the main reasons why people believe that they want to go with their own. They want to net a little bit more if they can avoid those. Yeah, sure. That, that commission. But right. they may also be leaving a lot of money on the table if they go that route. They but can. Yeah, so that, so I just put a couple of questions yeah, out yeah, there. Yeah, I want to hear them. So, number one, ask yourself, are you up to date on all of the latest real estate-related laws? Because there are things with regard to disclosure, proper forms to use, all that kind of stuff. So, do you understand that disclosure? Do you know what you have to, to relay to the sellers, to the buyers? Do you know how to market the home to get the greatest exposure? We talked about our 27-step plan. Do you have a 27-step plan? <laughs> That's a bargain. I doubt it. I'm no, playing. they think they can put it on uh, a Zillow. And, or, yeah, and it's done. Yeah, it's the selling. it's the three Ps. And take a few pictures. Put a, sign in the, put a sign in the yard, put it in the MLS or Zillow or whatever, and then pray that it sells. Pray that it sells. Yeah. yeah. It'll sell. It just will. Just at a much lower price than it would. And it might take you a little while. Well, sometimes well, a lot Well, in longer. this market, you would think it would sell, depending. Yeah. And it can take a lot longer because here's the thing. Most buyers are represented by an agent. Mm -hmm. Whether you right, want to deal with that or not, that's how that's where most buyers come from. So right. you diminish your buyer pool tremendously right. if you're not willing to cooperate with agents and work with them to get your home sold. So it's just another factor to consider. All right. Do you have a way of managing showings to help get the greatest number of potential buyers in the house? That's, we use automated tools that uh, make it easy for somebody to request a showing, for you to approve a showing as a seller, or we can approve it if you tell us it's okay. Kind of works like open table, I bet. It's very similar, yeah, absolutely. You make a reservation right. to mm -hmm. go to a showing, I would imagine. Yeah, very similar. But 
If you don't have that way of handling it, you're going to be fielding calls all day long. Well, not only that, I, something occurred to me when I thought about uh, a for sale by owner, an owner selling a home, yep. fielding all these calls. Mm-hmm. Now, you've given probably your personal or mobile phone number to people who know you have a house for sale yeah. and you set yourself up for a fraudster or some or a criminal who could potentially that's take a great point of you. right that's a great point There's versus a, having some insulation right by using a realtor to list the property and yeah we will take all those calls for you all day, well, yeah all day long think but. about uh, there's tons of people who are always looking for advantage and i wouldn't be surprised if there are those out there who look at for sale by owners and call up and ask about things and say hey you know when can i see it or you know have access to the house and instead of showing up to see the house and a robbing you or something like great criminal. point it's a great point great way to case the place right yeah all right do you have time to be present at home inspections or to answer questions but without hovering and disturbing the inspectors and the buyers because that's annoying too sure. right but but we as listing agents we show up at every home inspection we have it's a it's a it's a fiduciary responsibility that we have to our sellers so we show up even though it's not the the buyer is paying for their inspection and their agent should be there with the buyer during the home inspection but we're there to represent you the seller during that process as well but if if you're not available to be there for that home inspection well you lose out on that opportunity and something that could be rather minor or that you know you've already dealt with like oh there's this water stain on the ceiling and it yeah. puts this doubt in the buyer's mind that, oh my gosh, but you know that just last month you put a brand new roof on the house and you know that that leak was from before then mm-hmm. and you've had no you've had no issues since then. Well, the idea is in the buyer's head now already. Now, so so be there to answer those kinds of questions. Right. But if you're, if you're not available or along the lines of availability do you do you want to answer those frantic buyer agent questions at 9 p.m on a thursday evening most right don't, yeah most people don't want to do that all right and then are you comfortable with maybe as to your point earlier michael maybe accepting a lower price for your home uh, dave ramsey uh, love him or hate him okay dave ramsey just uh, posted well, something. Yeah, that's a huge number, fifty-eight thousand. I always wondered about a. Yeah. I was wondering about a study that gave us as a percentage of sales price how yeah. much less. Yep. Or home sold without an agent net on average per Dave Ramsby about fifty-eight thousand dollars lower numbers. than homes sold by agents. That's way more that's than making commission. up for the, the value of that commission. And I'm only about seven percent of the sellers that go for sale by owner actually wind up selling their their homes themselves the rest wind up either up not selling it and or it they work with a realtor and end up working so, with a realtor they say oh yeah. i'll try it myself for and meanwhile how many buyers have you lost out on while trying to go in on your own absolutely you miss absolutely. timing with rates timing with the market whether it's spring or fall the heavy buying seasons if you try to do it yourself yep so yep all right so we're going to go on to the last i'm going to throw a bonus point you out did, there you again. did it last week you turned it up to 11 last week i'm Let's doing t- it again another spinal tap moment right. yeah so up we're going to add 11. another bonus point hiring an inexperienced agent to sell your home and it, i i get this i mean you know somebody who just got their license you know your son-in-law or your great niece or your neighbor's well, they don't even have child to be or, you have recent agent uh, to be an experience. And what I mean by that is there are m- many, many agents out there who only f- close, been doing it for a while, but only close a few transactions yeah, two or a three year. transactions a year. They're just Trouble. keeping their foot in the water. Right. Yeah, yeah. They to help their friends every once in a while. Help their friends every once in a while. And, and the challenge is that working with agents like that, you can, I mean, there, there are a lot of legal issues ev- involved in selling a home. And, well, and, you and then get it's, some bad advice, right? And you're right. A lot, most more times than not, it is a friend or a relative that they're trying to help out who really needs, you know, could use the listing, is either new or doesn't have a ton of experience. Sure. And you want to help them out. You do want to get help that out. feeling, yeah, right? I mean, too. I hey, we all had to start somewhere, mm-hmm. right? Well, we have new agents on our team, but sure. they're also on our team, so they have 
experience. They have right. experienced agents behind them. Yeah. And and most people think, oh, you know, I'm pretty intelligent. I can make the decisions. Everything will be fine. But it, there are plenty of things that um, can go wrong. There are things that can go wrong. You could you could try it that way, but I've I've personally experienced that. I've asked the, uh, I've had situations where somebody was looking to. I pre-approved somebody to buy this and their house isn't selling, and I talked them, and you know I don't want to get involved with who their agent is to sell their house but after it's been sitting a while i'll ask questions well how do you know them and you know where did you get them and a lot of times with these houses that have sat and have not sold they hired a friend yeah. or a family member to list list their house and that could be the problem yeah yeah so the you know the point is you know your, your great aunt trudy's sister's niece is not necessarily the best strategy for finding an agent to list your home. Agreed. So, so do some do some research, check some Google reviews. Yeah, there you go. Look at look at what other people are saying about referrals those people. from pe- uh, it's the strongest thing people you know, that's always a great referral. Yeah. With- yep. Absolutely. All right. So, Michael. Yes, sir. I think a pretty good list. That was a great list. Yeah. Wrapped uh, up the scoop and uh Yep. Yep. No time at all. Yeah, absolutely. And when we come back, we're going to jump right into the unreal and the spotlight. So we'll be back in just a sec. Trap. And we're back to Be Real, the Maryland Real Estate Podcast. I'm Brad Cox with the Vesta Group of Long and Foster, joined by the Simply Sagacious. Is it going to be alliteration every time? Not every time. Simply Sagacious Michael Becker <laughs> of Sierra Pacific Mortgage. There was a lot of S's there. There were. Yeah. Yeah. At least so. I don't have a lisp. Say my lessons. <laughs> that would be a challenge. All right, Make so Michael. F- yes, sir. Happy. <laughs> it's happy, April. F- happy Financial Literacy Month. So for the Unreal, I saw a headline that I thought bared a few minutes of comments on. Yeah. It's a CNBC story that we saw. It says, lack of financial literacy costs 15% of adults at least $10,000 in 2022. Would you 000. like to have that $10,000 back? Well, if they... It's people... Yes, sir. We've all been talked there's a lack of financial literacy or people make lots of bad decisions. And I, I often yep. wonder if it's um, a lack of education or financial literacy or just bad habits. And I think it's yeah. a combination of the two. Right. But right. I can attest to that $10,000. I was mentioning to you, I had clients, previous clients of mine who want to sell their current home and buy another house. Yep. They were credit five years ago when they bought their last house. We used FHA financing. They're right on the border for credit scores. Mm-hmm. They didn't have the greatest credit score. In fact, I seem to recall having to work on the credit scores to be able to buy that house. Yeah. Now their scores have taken a hit. They're below where they need to be. But I can get them back up again. But it's almost like a reinforcing cycle with a lot of people, this lack of financial literacy. They... You know, when I'm looking, and not only to look to improve your credit score, I analyze it. Not not that I want to judge, but here's a bad decision that was made by them. They bought a new car or needed a car. Right. The car costs $48,000. I wouldn't buy a forty eight. Well, maybe. No, nah, I probably still wouldn't, even though the price of cars since the last time I bought a car has gone up significantly. Still probably wouldn't spend that much yeah. on a car. They don't. They don't make a lot of money. The ninety thousand, it's a good bit for some people, but to buy a forty eight thousand dollar car. When you're only making ninety ninety thousand dollars. Correct. Yeah. Beyond that, they financed it for eighty four months. Wow. And that monthly payment, mm-hmm. nine hundred and twenty three dollars. So having Ouch. the amount they borrowed, the monthly payment and the term of loan, I can calculate the interest rate. Yeah. Turns out it was over sixteen percent. Which Oof. meant when I throw it at an am- amortization schedule, uh-huh. they were going to pay an additional twenty four thousand dollars in interest on that car. Wow! Uh, wow! It's half basically the, half the price of the ha- of the car again. Correct in interest. Yes, they could have bought another small car with the interest that they paid on it. So when wow. you get yourself in that uh, a financially literate person, look, things happen. Sometimes it can be medical things. You get a loss of job, you get fined, and your credit can be damaged. Yep, yep. But if you need a car in that case, maybe don't go out and buy a new car and have the finance manager find a way that the payment can barely fit into your budget yep. by stretching it out to 84 months. 84-month car loans were unheard of 
years ago. Sure. 60, there are people who complain. There's a lot of people out there say, if you can't afford a 36-month payment, you yeah. can't. Nowadays, you know, when you if you notice. Well, cars have gotten pretty expensive. They have gotten pretty expensive. Yeah. And it's because they're pretty sophisticated. Yep. But guess what? Those sophisticated and what better built cars yep. tend to last longer. Don't turn it in. Make them right. last. Right. They, right. I always remember the Millionaire Next Door book talking. This is an old book, but the average age of a millionaire's car is left somewhere between 11 and 12 years. Absolutely. I, don't, I have no plans. I, my car is paid off. It's... Got a uh, about one hundred and twenty thousand miles on it, half of its life maybe. So, right. So don't make a lot. And unfortunately, it does seem that there's a say that fifteen percent that costs ten thousand. It's the same fifteen yeah. percent. You can get out of that fifteen percent and get it. You just got to start making better decisions. We live in a time of instant gratification where people can get whatever they want via credit when they want it, as opposed to practicing. The road less traveled, delayed, you know, remember the Delayed, the gra- yeah, you right. Remember, Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. Well, that's a book that's called the right. Road Less Traveled that talks about delaying gratification. Yes. I just, you know, I was an English major, so I had to pull out Robert I mean, Frost. I know. It yeah. is a Robert Frost. Book. Yes. But, you know, education will help. And there's a, you're working yeah. on it in the state of Maryland, the legislature. There was, uh, yeah, state bill, what, 263, 268, two sides, one of those. Kathy Klausmeyer's bill. Senator yeah. uh, Klausmeyer introduced this bill, and she introduced it last year. Didn't quite make it out of committee last year. We're working on it again this year. But it's a, I think it's a great bill. Would well, introduce the, there's a lack of it in schools. It yeah. will help. However, I also read a Forbes article that stated you need reinforcement in the home. Yeah. If you parents who tell their kids to save, but don't save anything, aren't going to get children who do, who save. Right. right. Parents who do, do as I say, not not as I do. Parents who do not delay gratification. Yeah. Who preach that to the children are not going to get you. Who who always get their instant gratification aren't right. going to get children like yeah. that. Yeah. I I have a. I don't mind spending well, it's on... What's the actions speak louder than words? I don't mind yeah. spending on experiences. Yeah. Trips. Right. I like doing that and like concert tickets and things like that because life is short. Right. However, I like to pay for those things by pinching pennies wherever I can. Yeah. I yell at my kids if they take more than a half. You know those paper towels now that you can tear a half mm-hmm. or dry their hands? If they yeah. take more than one of them. I'm, I remember one time a kid was grabbing it. It's like six sheets of paper towels. I'm like, you're only <laughs> using that because you... How much, how much does a roll of paper towels cost, pal? Do you yeah. know? Right. That kind of thing. You know, I keep my house relatively cool in the wintertime. You're not supposed to run around. When my kids were younger, they were complaining it was cold. I'm like, put some clothes on. You're wearing a shorts and T-shirts. Right. It's wintertime. <laughs> right? Right. Those l- little things like that. So they, they learn go from a it. long way. Right. And people often think, they look at this one, oh, this one moment in time where, oh, it's only $20. But that's $20 every month over the course of several years. And it's it's those 15 or 20 Twenty dollar decisions that you make. Financial literacy is very important. I'm yeah. glad to see that we're putting or we're starting to put some emphasis on it. Maybe teaching it at school. Hopefully, but to all of our passes. listeners out there, if your parents teach it to your kids, and if you're going to become parents, think about it. You know, it's always easy to spoil a child. Yeah, but showing that teaching them discipline will serve them much better over the long run. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Michael. You're welcome. All right, so listen, we're rolling right into the spotlight this week. We're gonna we're gonna spotlight something that it's been around for a while, but it's been around in other iterations other for a well, long, be, long, my, long time. My bus every day to school at Lock Raven went right by it. How every about that? Day. Yeah. So we're talking about McFall's Iron Horse Tavern. We're actually headed there this evening. It's, well, good for you. Which is why it was an opportune time to talk about them. But unfortunately, it won't be one of those evenings you can sit out on the deck and look over Lock Raven. Ah, it's the best. It's absolutely. It's going to be yeah, a little chilly that. tonight, but it that is, is a nice yeah, way to do it. Yeah. yeah. Well, and we got my whole family, my my kids, oh, my right. sister and her kids. They're all, everybody's, 10 of us going tonight. Oh, so wow. it'll be nice. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Good for you. But anyway, all right. So McFalls. Well, they're, what did it used to be? I, yeah. You're in high school. I know Sanders Corner, if and you remember, if you've been around for a while. Yeah. And My girlfriend in high school worked there. Yeah. She How sold ice that? cream. I remember the that? blue. Yeah. I was telling you, I love the blueberry. The blueberry ice cream. Ice cream. Yeah. But, that was amazing. Yeah. But now. Yeah. Now it's McFall's Iron Horse Tavern. So they're at 2260 Cromwell Bridge Road, Parkville 21234. 
And it, yeah, if you've been around, you probably remember Sanders Corner. It's right there at the entrance to Lock Raven Reservoir. Now, going way, way back, like the 1800s. Mom and Pa stop. Uh, yeah, it was a stop on the Mom and Pa Railroad, but it was also a black. Smith. Oh, shop. Okay, yeah, yeah, like, I do remember that. Really long, 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 long. long I can time visualize ago. in my memory what the inside of Sanders Corner store looked like. Uh, yeah, it's much different as McFalls. Oh, yeah, very different. Yeah, but yeah, so it was a Ma and Pa Railroad stop. Yeah. That they used to deliver mail there. It was a that was actually part of the the Lock Raven Post Office was in that location, hmm. and that that name Iron Horse, kind of a dual purpose because it refers to the to the train that used to 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 travel the ma and pa railroad and it also pays homage to a lot of the old uh baltimore sports legends like johnny unitas brooks robinson cal repkin a couple others but anyway i want to say i'm sorry to throw you off it's all right but it makes sense if cal ripkin's there because i believe the man whose record he broke Lou Gehrig was referred to as the Iron Horse. Uh, I'm yeah. looking it up. I'm pretty yeah. sure he was. I bet. Okay. Yeah. So maybe that's part of it too. Could be. Yeah, the sports legends. Well, so, and yeah, when you go in, you'll notice, I mean, they've got a lot of sports memorabilia in, in certain parts. Anyway, so it's been owned by Glenn McFall since 2008. They also just recently, I don't know if you saw this, Michael, but they opened a sister restaurant at uh, right on the water in Essex I called did McFall. Know that. Yeah, McFall's Oyster and Real. Ooh. Uh, so I actually haven't been to that one yet, but I plan to check it out. But anyway, when you go inside, they got a number of different seating areas. The front dining room has this really nice fireplace. Mm-hmm. Then they have the Baltimore room that can be rented out for like private events. And then they, the Lock Raven room in the back has the bar and all the Raven stuff. But yeah, to your point earlier, my favorite place sitting on the deck it's the deck is really looking awesome. over lock raven it's nothing like it yeah it's it's slice heaven back there all right so their crab soup they were really yeah, good what's the salad the avocado so it's a, it's a cob salad with, with avocado in it I yeah like the avocado salad <laughs> that is really good i usually add i add some blackened chicken to that uh-huh. and it's it's super awesome um they're they got steamed shrimp. I get a ton of that usually, and the, but they've got pizzas, sandwiches, That's uh, not easy and then they got yeah, good. yeah. And they got some of those pub foods like fish and chips and shepherd's pie, and they have a really mean shrimp and grits. So anyway, it's a great spot to go. It's sit by the fire in the cool months, or you can chill out on the deck when it's warmer. Most days they open up eleven thirty a.m. Um, Sunday I think they open up at ten a.m. And then they go pretty late. Most days they're they're there until after eleven, and on the weekends I think till one a.m. So pretty oh, late. Wow. If you haven't been, give them a try. They're at McFall's Iron Horse, and it's M C F A U L S Iron Iron Horse McFall's Iron Horse on Instagram or McFall's Iron Horse dot com on the web. I just on the web. It. Or you can call them 410-828-1625. We'll put some some of their information in the show notes. And uh, it's right on the corner of Cromwell Bridge Road and Lock Raven Drive. That yes. drive that one right into the windy the, part of Lock right Raven. Right into the reservoir. Right. Yeah, yeah, great spot. So check it out if you haven't been there. Michael. Yes, sir. Great, great episode 13. And with a little luck, might make it under an hour. (laughs) (laughs) Now, our next episode, we're going to talk about home buying with renovation loans. Oh, okay. Because we've been talking a lot about these, hey, buyers, here's a hit, here's a hint. Think about maybe buying a diamond in the rough. Well, so we're we're going to put up or shut up. We're going to talk a little bit about how you can do that with some of these products that are out there. So that's next week's episode. Uh, check us out on the web if you want to listen to us berealpod.com you can listen right on the site you can also submit comments or feedback but anyway let us know what you think if or or what you'd want us to talk about uh, you can also listen to us on any of the major podcast platforms so Michael yeah. somebody wants to ask you about mortgages how do they get in touch? Uh, they can give me a call my cell phone number is 443-310-0012 or email me at michael.com Becker at spmc.com. Great, Michael. And to reach me, 
either the phone or the text 410-375-7550 or via email brad at homesbyvesta.com. Folks, thanks so much for listening. Thank you. Michael, thanks for another great episode. You too, my friend. And we'll see you all again on the next episode of Be Real. Be Maryland Real Estate Podcast. Take care, folks. Try it.